Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve sallallahu ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Tonight we begin the first class on what is Sufism. And these will be hopefully <coughs> more than just uh, elementary introductions about this phenomenon which is so important in our religion and our religious tradition. So we want to talk about what does that mean? Where does it come from? What is it and what is it supposed to be? And um, this is an extremely important topic for all of us here and in fact for Muslims in general. Is there any word in the Muslim lexicon today that is more stigmatized than Sufism. It's a word that we often cannot use in many contexts. And this is in fact one of the biggest problems that we face because Sufism is at the very core of what Islam has always been about. And we want to talk about this objectively, and we want to talk about this comprehensively as much as is possible. And we also want to talk about why the word and concept Sufism is so stigmatized today. Because that's very, very important. Why, how did that happen? And uh, so, inshallah, this will be a class. Um, it's not academic, but I do hope it to be sound and I hope it to be thorough. And therefore, I ask your permission uh, to use my computer and not to try to speak from memory or from inspiration. Because there are a lot of points that I want to cover and therefore I like to organize them on the computer and read from the cube computer, although that's often very, very unpleasant for many people today. And that's because we live in the culture of television and YouTube and social media and entertainment. And so therefore, the spoken word as written word being read is very difficult for many people to accept. <clears throat> so what is Sufism? And where does it come from? And inshallah, we'll have five lectures. They are relatively long. I hope that won't tire you. And we will try to have questions at the end of them. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. And I'll try not to repeat myself. So please try to come to all the classes. And we will try to, st to, st to start on time. Uh, tonight we were a little bit delayed because of problems with the uh, reception and the online um, uh, transmission of the lesson. But here we begin with one of the most important of all hadith, which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, and this is Umm al Sunnah, Umm al Hadith, the foundation of the hadith, the foundation of the Sunnah. We have a hadith like that, just as we have Umm al-Kitab, which is al-Fatiha. And Umm al-Sunnah is the famous hadith of Jibreel. And it comes at the very end of the prophetic legacy. It's right towards the end. Uh, some scholars have said that it was just before Hijjat al Wida'. It was just before the farewell pilgrimage. That would be in the year 10, which was the final year of the Blessed Prophet's mission, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And therefore, this hadith comes right before the cutting off of the revelation that was coming to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's a closing chapter, although it's like Fatiha, which is an opener, but it's a closing chapter. And in it, our scholars believe all the hadith and all the sunnah are embodied. 
Al-Qadi Iyab, he says that all of the knowledges of the Sharia, ah, they go back to this hadith. So it is an, imp uh, an important place to begin. And it is totally authoritative. Not only is it authentic, but it is mutawatir, or very close to that. It is multiply transmitted. So it's one of the most authentic of all the reports that we have from the Blessed Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mullah Ali Al-Qari, Allah be pleased with him, he says that Hadith Jibreel is called Ummul Hadith because it includes the Sharia, ah, the Tariqa, and the Haqiqa. It has all of these in it. Um, and then it says it also has a Bayan Ijmali, it has a comprehensive exposition of the faith like Surah Al-Fatiha does of the Qur'an. One of the things we'll see in this hadith is that Ihsan, moral perfection, the doing of goodness in the best way, uh, this is the epitome of the religion. The hadith will indicate that to us, that it is the pinnacle of the religion. That ihsan then is the interior realization of Islam and Iman. Islam and Iman, as spoken of in this hadith, they come together in ihsan. They are realized in ihsan and in selfless exterior service to God and to creation with honest and correct interior belief in Him. And Sufism is divine service in this fullest sense, as we will see, that includes Islam and Iman and is the science of Ihsan. In fact, some people have called Ihsan perfect, divine service. I don't use that myself, but it's a, a very nice expression. And if we wanted to link this blessed hadith, Umm al-Hadith, Hadith Jibreel with the Qur'an, then perhaps we could do that by linking it with the beautiful verse number three of Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah. الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ One of the greatest of all the gifts that God has given us in His book. This verse also is very late, and although the commentators disagree about when it was revealed, they disagree in a way very similar to the way they talk about Hadith Jibreel that this was something uh, around the time of Al-Hudaybiyyah, the armistice, or maybe Hijjat al but it's right there at that end period as well. This day, God says, I have perfected for you your religion, deen. Now, Hadith Jibreel is going to say, what is deen? What is religion? But now it is fulfilled. Now the message has been delivered. This day have I perfected for you your religion and fulfilled my blessing upon you and contented myself with Islam for you as a religion. Um, again, this comes very late and, um, you know, the two go together. Now, let's take a look at the Hadith Jibreel, which I know that there's probably no one here who doesn't know it, and many of you know it much better than I do. But we will take one of the riwayas of it, which is that of Ibn Umar, or of Umar, uh, through his son Ibn Umar. And um, it's really beautiful to actually study this hadith more comprehensively by putting together the different transmissions of it, because they add things which are remarkable, that make the picture really clear. <clears throat> but in this hadith, and let's we'll say it in English, we don't have that much time. It would be really good to say it in Arabic, and Arabic has that right over us. But we'll rely on English if you permit me as much as possible. 
So, Umar transmits in this hadith, while we were in the presence of God's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a certain day, suddenly there appeared to us a man with intensely white garments and intensely black hair. No sign of travel could be seen on him, and no one among us knew him, or we could say recognized him. He came forward until he sat just in front of the Prophet وسلم, and placed his knees against those of the Prophet وسلم, and placed the palms of his hands on his thighs. Some will say that he placed them on his own thighs, but others say that he placed them on the Prophet's thighs. And this is a report that we understand in the light of Arabian culture. Because this is a particular way of approaching a Sayyid, a lord of the tribe, or in this case a teacher. And it indicates that you have great need and urgency in what you are saying. And also it's been taken as an embodiment of the way that the relation of the student to the teacher should be in all respect and also um, you know with this kind of deference you know for the teacher and then this beautiful man said and of course already even in the wording of uh, this hadith you see that this is strange isn't it because we call Medina a city but today we would probably call it a village because it wasn't as big as Cairo or Beirut or these other cities that we have in the world today. In fact, a big city at that time would be a city that had a million people and there were very few of those. And Al Medina is really a cluster of oases that are wall and, and of fortresses that are walled. But the people of Medina all knew each other and they knew who was among them and who was not. And they knew who were the guests who came to the city. And however you came to Medina, you had to come through arduous travel on camelback, on donkeyback, mule, and other walking. And you would be dirty, covered with dust, thirsty, and there would be other signs of travel on you, probably exhaustion. And yet this man comes radiant and beautiful, and there's no sign of travel on him, and none of them know him. So who is this? Where did he come from? If we took the other transmissions of the Hadith, they bring this out very clearly. That in fact the Sahaba wondered among themselves, that who is this? What is this? So then this beautiful man, he comes up to the Prophet and we learn from other transmissions of the Hadith that at that time, this is the very end of that beautiful dispensation of the coming of the Blessed Prophet, that the Sahaba had built a dukan for the Prophet. Of course, the word that we think of is a store, but dukan doesn't mean that here. Dukan means a platform, and probably the original dukans, dakakin, were platforms where a merchant would put his or her goods. But they built a platform for the Prophet so that he will stand out somewhat from the crowd, because now many people are coming to visit him. So they have this platform, maybe it's about this high, I don't know. And it's made from clay bricks. So he's sitting there, and in some of the transmissions they talk about the dukan, the platform, and that Jibreel actually doesn't come up to the platform at first, he sits at a distance, and he says, you know, adnu, and the Prophet would say, udnu. Do I come closer? He would say, come closer. Do I come closer? Do, uh, uh, one even, adnu au tadnu. Do I come closer or you? And then he comes closer and then he comes on the platform and he sits right up in front of the Prophet 
So all of them see this also, it's on a platform. All of them can see this. And then this beautiful man, he says, Muhammad, tell me about Islam. And God's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Islam is that you bear witness that there is no God but God, and that Muhammad is the Messenger of God, first pillar. That you establish the daily prayer, second pillar. Pay the obligatory charity fully, third pillar. Fast Ramadan, fourth pillar. And make pilgrimage to the house, to the house of God. If you are able and find a way to it, fifth pillar. He said, you have spoken the truth, sadaqat. So how strange, how absolutely amazing. You have spoken the truth. So Umar says, we were amazed at him, asking the Prophet, and then stating that he had spoken the truth. This is unusual. Then he said, tell me about Iman. The messenger said, that you believe in God. This is the first fundamental of faith. His angels, second. His books, third. His messengers, fourth. The last day, and that you believe in Qadr, the measuring or the pre-measuring or the predestination <coughs> of things by the will of God. Qadr, that of it which is good and that of it which is evil. He said, you have spoken the truth. So again, it's amazing. And then he says, so tell me about Ihsan. And the messenger said, that you worship God as if you could see him. For even if you do not see him, he surely sees you. This is Ihsan. And so then he said, so tell me about the hour, the hour of the coming of the last day. The messenger said, the one who is asked is not more knowledgeable about this than the one asking. Um, Then he said, so tell me about its sign, or signs, but in this transmission, it's sign. The messenger said that the maiden, the Emma, slave girl, or the maiden, could also be a young girl, give birth to her mistress. In another transmission, that she give birth to her lord, her master. And that you see the barefoot, naked, and needy herdsmen of sheep vying with each other in building tall buildings. Then he went away, and I, this is of course Umar, the narrator, remained for a long time, not knowing who this was. Then one day the Prophet said, Umar, do you know who the person was asking the questions? I replied, God and his messenger know best. The Prophet said, it was Jibreel, Gabriel, who came to you, we can say to all of you, to teach you your religion. This is the transmission of Muslim. This is an extremely important hadith. In it we see that Islam has three fundamental elements, that the deen, has three fundamental elements. Islam, which is the five pillars, and then we know from other hadith that those five pillars are the props that support all of the law. So it's the outward law, the ahkam, what we do, what we don't do, how we dress, how we eat, how we live with each other, the things we perform, acts of worship and so forth, and iman, and we have the six articles of faith, but of course there are many others. So we have sciences for that. And then ihsan. So these are the three elements of the deen. 
Now, some scholars say that this hadith indicates that there are four elements. And they say that the signs of the end of time constitute a fourth element. Other scholars say that they constitute part of the second element because they're part of Iman. And we won't get into that discussion. But, of course, they are very important. Otherwise, Jibreel wouldn't have asked about them. And uh, they are a very important topic, although they're not the topic that we intend to speak about here. So here, we see in this hadith that Islam, Iman, and Ihsan um, are all essential to the constitution of this deen. And not only that, but we can see here, as I said, that Ihsan is the highest level of these. It is the epitome of these. It is the fullest embodiment of these. And these three elements need to be harmoniously integrated with each other for the deen to be what it's supposed to be. And they should be integ integrated into our personalities as well. They should be, all of them, real for us in every way. <clears throat> so, again, we see from this that Ihsan can rightfully be called, you know, the purpose of it all. And the lifeblood of this faith. It's extremely important. Now, each of these elements has sciences that go with them. Uh, Islam has the science of fiqh and of ijtihad and of ilm al-qilaf and usul al-fiqh and al-qawa'id al-fiqhiyya and maqasid al-shari'a and so forth. So all of these are sciences that pertain to fiqh. They're very, very important. And all of them develop in history and they also develop different names. Even the restriction of the word fiqh to ahkam, to the rulings of law, is what we call semantic closure. Semantic closure. It means that we restrict the, or we limit the meaning of the word. Because fiqh itself in the Qur'an and the Sunnah refers to the comprehensive understanding of everything that pertains to God and to the religion. It's not just law, it's also faith and it's other things as well. Knowledge of the heart. But we will limit in common usage the word fiqh to the study of ahkam. So this is an innovation that takes place in Islam. Is it allowed or not? Um, of course, probably no one would say that it's not allowed. Imam al-Ghazali will warn you about taking it too literal. But um, nevertheless, it was necessary to give that science a good name. And Iman will have sciences as well. And among the most important of those are what we call theology, ilm al-kalam, ilm al-tawheed, and um, other things related to that. So what then is the science of Ihsan? And if each of these other ones have sciences, why would Ihsan not have one? How could it be the epitome of these and not require serious thought and study like they do? Not require a science, you know, that is laid down in order to pursue them. And here, the name of that science came to be called in Islam, what? Sufism. This word that is so stigmatized today that we can hardly use it. But we made that word for this particular science. That was an innovation. That was a bid'ah. But bid'ah always has five evaluations. It's either obligatory or it is recommended, or permissible, or it is disliked, or it is forbidden. And I don't know of anyone who said this was forbidden. 
In fact, you'll see that there's a special reason why this strange word, this unusual word, Sufism, was chosen as the name of that science. So, Sufism is the word that we picked historically over more than a thousand years. In fact, over more than 1,300 years to describe the science of Ihsan. And it is also here that we will find ethics. Ethics, the understanding of value, of good and evil, of morality, of character, of training. All of this will come under the heading of Ihsan. So this becomes an extremely important component, not only of our religion, but also of our civilization. <clears throat> so, what is Sufism? Let's talk about that a little bit, and then uh, we'll come back to the name. Um, one of the great Sufis, whose name is Abu Hafs, they asked him, what is a Sufi? And he said, it's a person who doesn't have to ask what's a Sufi. But we won't stick with that definition. That's, that's not the best. But... Um, the definition of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani is that Sufism is a Sidqu ma'al haqq wa husnul khuluqi ma'al khalq. That Sufism is truthfulness with God, the real, a Sidqu ma'al haqq and good character, husnul khuluqi ma'al khalq good character with creation. Because if you have that, you will get everything else. And um, <coughs> so, um, what is Sufism? Again, we'll, we'll talk about this from many different aspects, but one of the things I want to emphasize now, and we'll come back to this, is that Sufism is distinctly and authentically Islamic. It is rooted in the core ethos of this deen. <clears throat> so it's not an afterthought. And it's not something that came from the outside. And this is something we'll talk about in greater detail further down the road, because questions obviously arise. But Sufism is distinctly Islamic. Again, the name is an innovation, but so is Aqidah, and so is Nahu, and so is Sarf, and so is so many other terms that we have, even the sciences themselves. And for that matter, the compilation of the Qur'an itself is an innovation. It's a bid'ah. Um, the Prophet وسلم, did not compile the Qur'an. That was done under the direction of the first Caliph Abu Bakr. What kind of an innovation was that? Obligatory, recommended, permissible? Obligatory, absolutely imperative. Um, one of the things we have to s stress about Sufism is that it is amal. It is practice. Um, it is putting to practice the rules of the law and the articles of faith with absolute conviction, living the religion. And it's the fruit that comes from that. Practicing what you preach, putting into practice what you know. And this is important to stress because the Sufis they plant trees that bear fruit. And that fruit is among the sweetest and the most beneficial that human beings have ever received. And it's God's gift. But, and among those fruits is incredible knowledge, profound, aesthetic, ethical, metaphysical, psychological, educational, civilizational knowledge. But that's not what Sufism is all about. It's about amal. It is about practice. Living the deen. 
And when you live it, then God will give you as an inheritance what you did not have. So all the wonders of Sufism, and there are very many, and we're going to talk about them. And uh, it's a very important topic. But all of these wonders of Sufism, they are the fruits of those beautiful trees. And those trees were planted in action. And they were watered by action. And they grew by action. Very sincere men and women. <clears throat> and this is a blessed tree that bore fruit in all seasons. Again, we could compare Islam, the, the Qur'an does compare this religion to a blessed tree, right? And we're told in the commentary that's the date tree, the date palm, all aspects of which are beautiful. But we could also say that Islam, this great message of, that our Prophet gave us, وسلم, it is like a seed. And you know, if I have a date seed, it's about this big. Right? The date palm's in that seed, isn't it? But how would we know? We have to plant it. We have to water it. We have to take care of it. We have to let it grow up. And then we see the wonder that is a date palm. Every part of which is beneficial. Every single part of which is be beneficial. And those who today undercut and disempower everything we do, this is bid'ah, this is bid'ah, this is bid'ah. Um, it's as if they believe that that seed was meant to be nothing more than a seed. How do you dare plant it? How do you dare cultivate it? How do you dare reap from it a harvest? And Islam was meant to be practiced. And it was meant to be a tree that would grow. And again, this was a tree for all seasons, and for all climates, and for all people. So what it bears in one people is not exactly what it bears in another. And everything that it does is incredibly beautiful and beneficial. Uh, so we have to plant that seed ourselves, and we have to water it, and take care of it, and we have to let it grow up ta'ala among us. Imam al-Junaid, who is, as we say, Imam al-Ta'ifa, he is the Imam uh, of this group of people, the people of Ihsan. He is the undisputed Imam. In fiqh we have many Imams, and God bless them. Each of them is a door to paradise. And in Aqidah we have two great Imams, and we have also many Imams as well. And, but in Tasawwuf we have one Imam, and that is Abu Al-Qasim Al-Junaid Al-Salik. He is our Imam. And he says, Sufism is not achieved by much prayer and fasting. You'll see in a future lecture that there's actually a hadith, which may not be the strongest of hadith, but it's actually what's being echoed here. But he said that Sufism is not achieved by much prayer and fasting. Although the Sufis prayed and fasted more than you and I could imagine. But that's not the secret. But it is the security of the heart. It is security of the heart, I'm sorry, and generosity of the soul. Actually, we should probably say I think the word here is Salama to Sadr. I actually took this from Shimmel, uh, whose book, uh, Mystical Dimensions of Islam, is a useful source, although it's not enough. But Sufism is Salama to Sadr. That's actually what the Hadith says and what they said. It is the soundness of the heart and it is generosity of the soul. Um, and sometimes they add in this one hadith and in other transmissions, which you'll hear tonight, they say that it is also a nushu lil ummah, giving sincere advice to the ummah. <coughs> um, Al Junaid also said that Sufism 
is to possess nothing and be possessed by nothing. And again, you have to understand what they say, not with a grain of salt, but, you know, in a legitimate way. They don't mean you have to be poor to be a Sufi. Because Imam al-Junaid wasn't like that himself. He lived in a good house. And he had beautiful clothing. But, in a way, you don't own anything in the sense that you're not so attached to it that you're preoccupied with it. And you're not owned by it either. <clears throat> um, Islamic authenticity is the standard by which Sufism measures itself. This is what we want to focus on tonight. And measures its own people. And the validity of all of its internal developments, its expressions, and its external achievements. Meaning by that, that this phenomenon comes out of the core of Islam. And it is Islam. It's Sharia. It's Aqidah that also is the standard by which it is known to be valid or invalid. Imam al-Ghazali says in his Ihya that we learn from the Arifin, the great knowers of God, this is one of the words we often use for the Sufis, that whoever does not have some portion of this knowledge, we fear for them a bad end. Su al Khatima. You know, that uh, this knowledge is a gift of God, a supreme gift of God. And therefore, we hope that all of us have a taste of it, that all of us have respect for it. And again, we're going to see that that doesn't mean that we're not critical of the failures of the people who sometimes claim to represent it. Because that's also required of us. And no group is more critical of itself than the Sufis are of themselves. They are much more critical of themselves than the Fuqaha are of themselves. Or than the scholars of theology are of themselves. They are very critical of themselves. <clears throat> but Imam al-Ghazali says, that you must have some portion of this knowledge. This is your salvation. This is your attachment to the prophetic legacy in the most genuine way possibly, possible. Imam al-Ghazali says, so make it your earnest endeavor to find that secret for yourself that was lodged deep in their hearts and try to lodge it in your own heart. What was that secret that was in the heart of Imam al junaid Or these other great men and women, Rabi al-Adawiyya, Abu Yazid al-Bistami. Okay, try to find that secret and put it in your heart. Seek to find this special knowledge. When Umar died, it was said, that nine-tenths of knowledge died with him. And Imam al-Ghazali says, do you think those were ahkam? Do you think that was recitation of the Qur'an? Do you think it was fatwa? None of that died with him, radiallahu anhu, but rather it was something more profound in his heart. So he said, try to get that nine-tenths and get it in your heart too. And Imam al-Ghazali adds, do not be deceived by the false pretenses and the misguided priorities of people around you who don't understand that, who don't share that conviction. Don't let that deceive you. Seek this knowledge for God's sake and for the hereafter, not for fame, not for wealth, not for the delusions of this world but seek it for your own well-being and your own happiness in this world and the next. Then Imam al-Ghazali also tells us what is the least portion of this knowledge. And I would believe and certainly hope and pray that just by our coming together here tonight, we all have that portion. 
And if we don't, we will all have it by the time we're finished. And the least portion of this knowledge, which in Imam al-Ghazali's belief is sufficient for a good end, is to believe in its general validity, a tasdeeq, to believe that it is a part of this deen, and to believe that it is a gift, and a taslim li ahlihi, and to turn its reality over to its people. So that means if you want to know what did they mean by these things they did and said, ask them, and trust in them, and learn from them, or at least let them speak. So because Sufism is the path of Ihsan, Sufism is the path to God. Okay, it is the path to find God and to know God. And nothing less than that will work. Okay, so it's not the path to be uh, miraculous or to be able to make a dua and there it is answered to have karamat or to have power or fame or anything else. All of that is false. The karamat are not false, but to seek them for their sake, that is delusion. Sufism is to seek God. It is to seek God. And you don't want anything between you and between Him. It is to worship God as if you could see Him. For although you do not see Him, He sees you. It means remove the barriers. All barriers that come between you and Him. All attachments that get in the way of attachment to Him. Again, as-sidqu ma'al haqq. Truthfulness with God, the real, good character with all creation. Um, people say, what is the intention that I need to take the path? And here the intention is to seek God. This is the intention for the path, that I want to know my Lord. I want to please my Lord. I want to find my Lord. I want to do this deen. And when you set things right between you and your Lord, everything else will be set right. So this intention is an intention that, set things, that sets things right from the very beginning. And inshallah, they only get better and better and better. So whoever sets out to reach God has declared war. Right? Against whom? Against Satan. And against your ego, your nafs. That's why this path is not that easy as it might sound. And that's why any man or woman who decides to take this path, Satan will be on their case from the very beginning. And he will come at them from the right and from the left and from the front and from the back and every way that he possibly can. And then he has an ally who is worth 70 Satans. And who is that? Me, myself, and I. The ego, this big, blustering ego, this Pharaoh in my heart. This Iblis in my heart is very much like Iblis. So um, that's why Sufism also is a science that needs to be studied because don't think that this path is easy. It's not New Age religion. It's not feel-good religion. Sometimes it's feel-bad religion. Um, so you take the path and you declare war against Satan and the lower self. And that's jihad. Now you're going to have to get involved in jihad. This is called the big jihad. And it's mujahada. Striving against myself. Striving against the delusions of the devil. And one of the things that's very important here is that one of the reasons why a lot of people actually don't like Sufism is for this very reason. Because um, 
wouldn't it just be better to go to the mall and McDonald's and go to the beach and have a good time? And we'll pray and we'll fast. And um, when we go to the holy cities today, uh, there's Pierre Cardin. You know, you come out of the elevator and there he is. So, um, a lot of Muslims, we make a truce truce, we make peace with Satan, that let me off the hook, okay, let me pray, let me fast, let me be a good boy, but I won't be too rough on you, and I won't be too rough on myself, so this is putting up the white flag, <clears throat> and that's in fact what most of us do, because it's not easy to go to war against the devil. And it's not easy to go to war against yourself and your own anger, your own appetite, your own delusions, your aspirations, and these other things. And therefore we ask God to give us the courage to follow this path, because this path does take courage. It does take courage. You've got to be strong. And this is also, again, why many people don't like it, because we want to have our Islam, we want to have our cake and eat it too. And we don't want anything that's really demanding. And again, the Sufi path, when properly practiced, is done with sheikhs who are extremely wise and who never demand of us more than we can take and begin us with baby steps. So they're not going to make it difficult for you, but nevertheless, there's going to have to be a commitment. So now, let's talk about the name. <clears throat> now, first of all, we said in the beginning that Sufism, as you know, probably better than I, is so stigmatized today. I would doubt there is a more stigmatized word in our lexicon. I know that my brother Hisham will give me some examples if there are, but I can't think of any right now. But let's emphasize the fact <clears throat> that for way over a thousand years, in fact for more than 1,300 years, um, more or less, this word was acceptable. And not only that, <clears throat> but it was a word that was looked upon with deference. And in fact, it was a word that no one claimed for themselves, or very few people. Almost no Sufi would say, I am a Sufi, because they would say, I'm not worthy of that name. I'm not worthy of that name. But this word was not always stigmatized. And the stigmatization of it is part of that strange self-hate that we Muslims have had in recent history, especially in the 20th century, to some extent in the 19th century, but especially in the 20th century. And when we begin in the wake of colonialism, sometimes during colon colonialism, you know, to rivet, you know, to, to, to destroy this civilization, and to leave nothing of it intact. <clears throat> and this is a name that must be re rehabilitated. We've got to overcome the allergies. We've got to get people to use this word with deference. And again, that doesn't mean to endorse every man and woman out there who calls himself or herself a Sufi. That we don't do. Because many of the things they do are not acceptable and they're not Sufis. But the word itself needs to be put in the lexicon again. We are told in the history of the Sufis that Sufism was a reality without a name. And then it became a name without a reality. Um, here they're speaking about the fact that that word wasn't there, as you've heard me say, and as you probably knew anyway. 
The Prophet ﷺ never uses that word. Um, the companions didn't use that word. The tabi'een, the successors, probably they begin to use that word. And then the, the younger successors, they do begin to be, use that word. But it was a reality that had no name. And they mean by this that it was the reality of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This was what he was. He was a man who worshipped God as if he could see Him. For although he did not, could not see Him, God saw Him. He never forgot that for a moment. Nor did Abu Bakr, nor did Umar, nor did Uthman nor did Ali or any one of the companions, men or women, Khadija, Fatima, Aisha, they lived this reality. They were always and forever the fullest embodiment of it. No one ever goes above them. Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, who is regarded to be one of the greatest of them all, Sultan al-Awliya, no one says that's false, they all agree to that. But he was once asked by a man who happened to be a Shi'i, and we don't want to say anything bad about the Shi'a here, but this man came up to him and he praised him in Baghdad, and he mentioned what, how successful he had been. He was extremely successful. No one in Islamic history after the caliphate has been more successful in restoring this religion and spreading this religion than Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. This is the Shaykh of Salah al-Din, the Shaykh of Nur al-Din, of Imad al-Din. This is a man who we will talk about a little bit in the days ahead. The, the Ummah did Tawbah at his hands. Jews became Muslims at his hands. They came even from Yemen. Christians came to him to take Islam. And we're told even that jinn came to him to become Muslims. So he's an amazing man. But um, uh, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Ajilani was asked, what do you say about Muawiyah? And of course the position of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah is we love all the companions. And we don't want to say ill about any of them. But he said, and he is a Hassani Husseini, you know, purely Ahlul Bayt. He says that I am not worth the dust under the feet of the camel of Muawiyah when he made jihad alongside the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, this is because the Sahaba lived in a different spiritual reality. And you and I can not really even imagine what that was. So they say Sufism was a reality that had no name. Then it became a name that had no reality. Now this statement, it became a name with no reality, that's the Sufis saying that. And this is an example of their own self-criticism, which is severe. And you hear them say that, that there, there, there are no sheikhs today. Imam al-Junaid will even say, most of the carpets of knowledge and ma'rifah have been rolled up. Very few of them are still spread. Okay, so they, they say that all the time. And they say that in humility. And they say that also because they want to warn you that you have to be on your guard. Because although there is Sufism, which is this incredible gift, there is also, with that gold, fool's gold and counterfeit currency. So beware. And don't just take everything at face value. You've got to know how to judge the Sufis so that you can see are they what they are supposed to be or not. Do they deserve that name or not? <clears throat> so in Sufism then the first link and the essential link is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is their Imam forever and ever. 
and his sunnah is their beacon and his Quran is their guide. And here we also want to emphasize a few points before we get back to the name. And that is the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Salat on the Prophet constitute therefore one of the pillars not only of our faith but especially of the spiritual path. The spiritual path must involve the love of the Prophet Sallallahu and Salat on the Prophet. And Imam al-Sakhawi tells us in his book Al-Qawl al-Badi'a that uh, one of the signs of the people of the Sunnah and of the Jama'ah is that they do abundant Salat on the Prophet. And again, he's not talking about the Sufis by themselves, but all those who love the Sunnah of the Prophet and who seek to follow it, this must be their mark, that they make lots of Salat on him. But that's also going to be one of the pillars of the path. And here it's important to emphasize also that therefore the following of his Sunnah should be done out of love for him, Sallallahu and out of understanding of what he was doing. And in fiqh we distinguish between the sunnah of his culture and sunnah al-hidayah, the sunnah of guidance. So there is a general sunnah often which is not concrete, which pertains to the way he behaved, the way he smiled, the way he walked, the way he dealt with people that are everlasting sunnahs of guidance. And there are other sunnahs that pertain to the way he ate, the food he ate, the way he sat, or the fact that they didn't have tables and chairs, um, that they rode on animals, that they lived in houses of adobe. Um, and in fact, the Prophet Sallallahu rarely dressed the way that we dress today, which we often call sunnah. In fact, the way they dressed usually was very similar to the way that the pilgrim dresses, you know, with an izar around the waist and with another cloth over the shoulders and then putting a turban on top of that, or the woman might put that izar over her head. And they tended to be poor people, by the way, also. But any attachment that we have to his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, should be based on love of him, and then also nasiha to him. Good counsel. This deen is nasiha. It is good counsel, sincerity of behavior to God, to his book, to his prophet, to the Muslims in general, and to the leaders and nasiha to the Prophet وسلم, is to make him beloved to people and to bring his message to people. So therefore, we practice his sunnah in such a way as to open people's hearts and not to close them. And here I'm dressed in this dress, which I hope is not a claim. But this happens to be my favorite dress, but I wouldn't always dress like this. If I want to go back home like this, I won't get on the airplane. <laughs> you know, so, but you know, there is a right... There's a time and place for everything. But we follow the Prophet out of love for him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and a type of love that, inshallah, leads to and is based in understanding. And there is something fundamentally amiss. There is something fundamentally wrong and lacking when people emphasize the sunnah, what they call the sunnah, and yet they don't cultivate love for the Prophet And often those same people, they don't usually give much attention to Salat on the Prophet as a Qurba. If they mention his name, they will usually give Salat on him. But they don't usually do it as a Qurba, as an act of worship to draw near to God. <clears throat> so follow his Sunnah because you love him and because you study his example and you understand his purpose the best that you can, and because also you know his infinite worth among human beings. So the first and essential link is the prophet, and the second is the companions. And then it is what we call a salaf salih These upright men and women of the first generations, meaning the companions, the successors, the successors of the successors, and the successors of the successors. Sometimes we cut it off at the third level. And um, 
the companions in the Salaf generally avoided making legal judgments. Imam al-Ghazali talks about this with, in detail and he gives us proof. Most of them didn't want to talk about the law, mostly because the law is such an immense responsibility. But rather they wanted to leave that to those of them who were regarded to be mujtahideen like Ibn Umar and Ibn Abbas and others, as Sayyida Aisha. Um, Only about two dozen of them, of the Sahaba, actually engaged in what we could call legal teaching. And they did this because of necessity. But most of them avoided it. And all of them, however, were masters of the heart. And that is not an exaggeration. All of them knew the fit of the heart. How the heart works how you keep the heart pure. And they understood the value of introspection, the value of introspection, of examining myself, taking myself to account. And, um, you know, we have so many stories about that, but we won't go into them. But all of you know the story, for example, of the woman who prayed and fasted all the time. And yet, she scourged her neighbors with her tongue. <coughs> and we could say, with her self-righteous tongue. And what did the Prophet say about her, sallallahu That she is of the people of the fire. And we say that because this talks about the importance of the heart. That what's her heart then like? Because the fact that she's doing this outward worship, if she doesn't have a sound heart, and a good tongue, then it's probably not being accepted, and it's probably fundamentally flawed. Um, and we look at the unique greatness of um, Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, whom the Sufis always regard to be one of the greatest among them, and he is, of course, the closest of them all to the beloved Prophet, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And again, um, his greatness, as Imam al-Ghazali says, don't imagine, if you ever would, that it was because he was a hafiz of the Qur'an, or because he knew the rulings of the law, or because he had the power to do incredible ijtihad, like compile the Qur'an, or that he was a great leader. Okay, Because those are things that were left in his ummah. But there was something special about him that was unique to him, that gave him a status above all others. And that, as the Prophet said, وسلم, was something that waqara fi qalbihi. It was something that lodged itself in his heart, you know, which is that precious gift of the knowledge of God and sincerity and truthfulness and goodness. Again, we mentioned about Umar ibn al-Khattab that when he died, one of the companions, it was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may God be pleased with him. He said that with this man, nine-tenths of knowledge has died. Again, Imam al-Ghazali said, and so what kind of knowledge would that be? Would it be detailed knowledge about mortgages? Or about buying and selling? Or about um, wudu? No, because that remains. That's not lost. And not to say that's not important. But that didn't die with him, nor did the recitation of the Qur'an, nor did many other things in his brilliance and his knowledge. But it was something else, which was that light that was in his heart, the light that came from the knowledge of God and the service of God. Um, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is, of course, one of these embodiments as well. Um, <coughs> In our own Wird, in the Qadri path, we have as element three of it, La ilaha illallah al-malik al al mubin Actually, that's virtually taken from Imam Ali, although it goes back all the way to the Prophet Noah. But this is one of the dhikrs that Imam Ali did all the time. He did very frequently. And then, of course, there's Salman al-Farisi. There are the people of the platform, 
Ashab al Sufa. Um, these are also ancestors of the people of Ihsan, of the Sufis. Some people even say that the word Sufism comes from them. Ahl al Sufa. There's Abu Dhar al Ghifari, who was the prototype of the Sufi Faqir. He possessed nothing but was totally possessed by God, and nothing possessed him. And he partook in God's everlasting riches. And then um, I think we can end here, you know, talking about the Sahaba with that, uh, that person who stands between them and the successors, that Barzakh or that Hamzat al Wasl. Maybe you can give me a better metaphor. <laughs> but this is Uwais al Qarani. And Uwais al Qarani belongs in time to the generation of the companions. But he never saw the Prophet Sallallahu And there are different stories about why he didn't. The Prophet knew him and he knew the Prophet. The Prophet loved him. In fact, even when the Prophet said Sallallahu that he could get the fragrance of um, Ar-Rahman, of the nafis of the Rahman from the Yemen, it's said that that's a reference to Uwais al-Qarani who was in the Yemen. He came also to Medina, it said, but he still didn't meet the Prophet. But usually they say that he didn't meet the Prophet because his mother needed him and he couldn't leave her, and he was devoted to her. Uh, Uwais al-Qarani uh, dies in the year 36. Um, that's during the Caliphate, the rightly guided Caliphate. That's the year 657 of the Common Era. And um, he is a person who is very important to the Sufis in their nomenclature and in their understanding of themselves. He is that exceptional person who is able to negotiate the path on his own with the guidance that comes to him from the Qur'an and from the Prophet. So he doesn't really have a direct shaykh, although we could say the Prophet is his shaykh. But he's not that kind of direct disciple like Abu Bakr was or Umar was. And Uwais receives his spiritual illumination um, through his personal effort. So this is important because some people will say, well, why do you need a shaykh in the first place? Um, if you're like Uwais al-Qarani, you don't. And we refer to people like that as Uwaisis. And there are, in Islamic history, Uwaisi men and women. There are people who really are so amazing and so spiritually equipped that they basically do it on their own. But that's rare. And that's very, very exceptional. Um, some people again say that actually even with Uwais al-Qarani and even with the Uwaisi, the Prophet ﷺ performs that task, but it's something that happens in subtle ways in the unseen. Imam Muslim transmits about Uwais al-Qarani that the Messenger of God uh, counseled Umar to ask Uwais to seek him out and to ask Uwais to ask God for Umar's forgiveness and to pray for him if ever Umar met him. This is Sahih Hadith. So Uwais is Sahih. There's no question about that. And uh, whenever people came from the Yemen, Umar radiallahu anhu would ask, is Uwais al-Qarani among you? The Prophet said of Uwais that he treated his mother kindly and that if he ever made an oath by God, God would fulfill it. Um, so, this is again about that reality that was, that had no name, and later on, you know, will be given a name. So here, um, we want to talk about the name. Um, I still want to preface that with a few words, if you'll allow me to do that. And here, um, I want to say that usually the Sufis prefer not to call themselves Sufis. And often they prefer the word tasawwuf. Um, now, why would they do that? And this is because tasawwuf is the attempt to be a Sufi. 
uh, just like at takhalluq so at tasabbur is the attempt to have sabr whereas to have sabr is something else so tasawwuf actually means to attempt to be like a sufi or to imitate the sufis so they usually don't want to go any further than that because to say you're a sufi that's a big claim and here to make sense of the name itself you have to understand that it is a name that makes no claim at all. And why? Because nobody knows what it means. It is a very unusual name in that regard. Every other name that we use in Islam is explicit. He's a Nahwi, he's a Mujtahid, he is a Muhaddith or she's a Muhadditha. Um, he is an usuli, an usul al-deen or usul al-fiqh. He's a mutakallim. He's a mufti or she's a muftiya. We have those two. Okay, all of those words we have, there's so many. They all tell us what the person is and we can't function socially without that. If you're a doctor, we need to know that and we need to see your shahada right and if you're a heart surgeon we want to know that about you that's not an ostentatious claim but the word sufi is totally different in this regard because nobody knows what it means it's one of the reasons why it sounds so strange because like what does that mean does it come from suf from wool that's possible and we'll talk about that in specific terms in a few minutes but most people don't think that's really what it comes from um, I would say it's probably the most likely thing because there's no big deal in wearing suf in wearing wool um, I do that myself sometimes and probably you do as well uh, some people say it's from sufa from the people of the bench the sufa these poor people that live there behind the houses of the Prophet that's possible. It's not a very good etymology. Maybe like Sufi, and then maybe it becomes Sufi, because it's not easy to say. Um, some people say it comes from As-Safa, purity. That's quite possible. We say Sufiya fahuwa Sufi. He became purified, Sufiya fahiyya Sufiya. She became purified, so she's a Sufi. But that's not agreed to either. And some people say it comes from a Saf al awwal the first line, that they're in the first line of the deen, maybe the first line of prayer, the first row of prayer. Um, some people would imagine it might come from the Greek, Greek word Sophia, which means wisdom, and from that we get philosophy, the love of wisdom. But that's usually regarded to be an unworkable etymology because that Greek word comes into Arabic with seen, and not with sod, and there might be other reasons as well. So here you have a word that really cannot be pinned down. And that's one of the things that makes it so appropriate. Because the Sufi, the man or woman of Ihsan, are people who want to be hidden. They don't want to be known. They are people who want to make no claim whatsoever. <coughs> and um, therefore we say, مِنْ كَمَالِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ الظُّهُورِ وَمِنْ كَمَالِ الْأَوْلِيَاءِ الْخَفَاءِ Part of the perfection of the prophets is to be unhidden, to be exposed, to appear. And part of the perfection of the awliya is to be hidden. So this is an asl. These are people who like not to be known, who like not to be exposed. Abu Madin al Ghawth, who's one of the great Sufis, he says, Al Ghayra an Ta'rif wa la tu'raf. Al Ghayra, which is, what would we say, defensive honor or the sense of honor is that you know and are not known. In other words, that you know God, but no one knows you do. 
You know God, but no one knows you do. And we'll look at this in the days of head. And you'll see that even this is one of the fundamental characteristics of most of the awliya, that most of them are not known. And they are men and women whose hearts radiate light, unlike anything in creation, and yet no one knows them, no one knows their name, no one misses them if they're absent, no one points at them if they're present. So hiddenness is very important. And hiddenness is the opposite of Satan. Because Satan is the one who insisted on being known, who insisted on appearing. And probably in everything we talk about, we can see that there is a consistent contradiction or difference between what the Sufis do and what they seek to do and what Satan does. They're always the opposite of that. So Satan wanted to be known and Satan also violated trusts and Satan also gave out secrets. And the awliya are totally the opposite of that. They are the keepers of trusts. They are the keepers of the greatest secrets and of the greatest knowledge, which they do not expose unless there is some beneficial and valid reason for doing so. And they also want to be hidden. And for this reason also, Satan, by his desire to be known, he puts a veil of creation between himself and between God. So he is mahjub. And the awliya of Satan, the saints of Satan, you know, they are also like that. They are mahjubun. Between them and between God is the veil of creation and created things, the attachment to creation, the devotion to creation, the preoccupation with creation. Uh, <coughs> Satan is destroyed for this very reason. Had Satan been hidden, had he not wanted to be known, then he would have been saved. Then he would not have been Satan. He wouldn't have been, he, he wouldn't have fallen. And in this hiddenness, and in the things that are corollaries of it, <clears throat> such as the keeping of secrets, they actually are corollaries of that desire to have nothing between you and God to have no hijab between you and God. So for the awliya of Allah, creation is never their focus. It is never their concern, the created world and anything in it. Um, they do not care about creation in that sense. They never put creation first. And um, Therefore, you know, they always seek to remove all the veils that could possibly be between them and between God. Um, sometimes the awliya... Um, don't fit into this pattern. Sometimes they do appear, and sometimes they expose themselves. And this we see in the great ones, the ones whose names we know, the ones whose names we celebrate, uh, like Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jidani, uh, Al Rifai, Al Badawi, uh, Al Dusuki, and so many others. Okay, so these are ones who do appear, and often these also have karamat. All of the awliya have karamat, but as a rule, they want those also to be hidden. In fact, we're told they are ashamed of their karamat. You know, but sometimes these will expose karamat, but that is the exception, it's not the rule. And they do it, as it were, for the mercy, as a mercy to the people, to also break the rock that is their hearts and to bring them to God. <clears throat> 
So we say as one of the principles of Sufism, beware of the maker of false claims. Um, and beware of making claims. And all of us should always be that way. That whatever you attain, and whatever people believe you to have attained, don't make that claim. And uh, the Sufi and the Wali of Allah, they never see themselves as having attained perfection. Again, Iblis is the opposite of that. He saw himself as the greatest of them all. He saw himself as having attained perfection, but they never do that. And this gift that they have, always to see themselves essentially at the beginning, even though they've been on the path for so long and they've gone so far, this is one of the signs of their righteousness. And it's also one of the secrets of their success in all that they do. They're not the makers of claims, whereas Satan is the prototype of the maker of claims. Ana khayrun minhu. I am better than he. And he's also the prototype of the false claim. Um, the angels also make a claim that we glorify you and we worship you and so forth. Theirs is not a false claim, although commentators say it's for this reason that they're commanded to prostrate. And that's a test for them. <clears throat> so the true Sufi never has a claim to make about himself. And in fact, he won't even use for himself or herself that word, which itself is so appropriate because it contains no claim. And in not making a claim, we also say that your nafs, your ego, always <coughs> remains al-muttaham al-awwal that your nafs always remains the first and primary suspect. <clears throat> so you never point a finger at anyone but yourself. <clears throat> okay, so as we said before, the other names that will be used in Islamic history, faqih, mujtahid, mufti, alim, imam, muhaddith, mufassir, and so on, which are all legitimate names, but all of them are claims. They're claims, of course, that have to be made. But the Sufis will not make that claim because there is no social necessity for that. Although sometimes they have to appear and sometimes they have to make themselves known. Again, uh, there are other names they might have used. But these are names that for them were unworkable. <clears throat> Mostly because of the fact that they are names of unacceptable claims. So they're the people of Ihsan. And their science is the science of Ihsan. But could they call themselves Muhsinun or Muhsinat? They are also the people of Salah, of righteousness and uprightness. But could they call themselves Salihun, Ana min salihin They are the Sadiqun. If anyone is, they are. But can they call themselves Sadiqun, that we are the people of truthfulness, we are the people of honesty, um, they are the people of Tawheed, and often they will be referred to as that, as Ahlul Tawheed, the people of real Tawheed, who see the oneness of God in everything. They are the people who see God in all that they do. They never forget God for a moment. But again, to say that we are the Muhyidun. We are the people of Tawheed. That would be an immense and arrogant claim. And when claims like that are made, they might not be removed, but they will always be tested. And therefore also it's wise not to make that claim and not to be tested. They could call themselves the awliya. And who here couldn't call himself that or herself? Because the awliya are the believers and they have many different degrees and many different levels. And yet again, that would be a claim. They could be called the Adi for the Arifun, and they will be called that. And they may call those among them that, but they don't use that word. So instead, you know, they took this particular word. There are other words that were applied to them, Fakir, 
um, one who is a dependent totally, not necessarily poor, but totally dependent. Uh, Darwish, which is the Persian form of that. They were called Nasik, they were called Zahid, they were called Abid. Uh, of course, among them there are people called Sheikh and Murabbi. Uh, often they will refer to themselves as the Qawm, as the people, which doesn't make any particular claim as, set, as such. And it is a word that comes in the Hadith, that there are, there are Qawms that the angels seek out who do dhikr. And sometimes they refer to themselves as the Ta'ifa. So let's talk a little bit now about the appearance of the name. Um, how are we coming for time? <clears throat> so we've used about an hour and a half. Are we going too slow? What do you say? Okay, uh, I hope you're not bored. Okay, not exhausted. I never know. I never know. Okay, all right. So, um, I'll, we'll try to finish up, inshallah. Let's go a little bit faster. So, when does that name appear in history? And among the earliest uses of the name Sufi is at the, um, you know, is um, Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Okay, and this is towards the end of the first century. He is one of the seven fuqaha. Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Um, he died around 106 or 108 of the common era, uh, of the Islamic era. And that would be around, if you're interested, 724, 726. So towards the end of that first century, uh, you have the great Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the grandson of the Caliph Abu Bakr, one of the seven fuqaha of Medina. <clears throat> and uh, he was called a Sufi. And he was called a Sufi because he wore Suf. He wore wool. Very beautiful, but he wore wool. Um, and Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, by the way, is one of the sources of Sufism. And he is one of the sheikhs of Jafar as Sadiq, whom he's related to through um, his grandfather Abu Bakr as Siddiq. <clears throat> Al Jahid tells us that he was given the laqab as Sufi, that Al Qasim was given this laqab. And he says that's because he wore white wool garments. Uh, he was, of course, a scholar one of the greatest of them all, a mujtahid, a man of great religiosity. He was a zahid, an ascetic, and he is a person who spoke about tawheed. That's what they say. Again, he didn't speak about tawheed just in the sense that he talked about theology or rudimentary theology, but that he spoke about tawheed in that comprehensive way of understanding God in creation. Um, in that same period, there is another man who um, is associated with the development of this word. And this is Muhammad ibn Wasi'ah, who died in 96, which is 714, that would be before Al Qasim. And uh, Muhammad ibn Wasi'ah fought under Utayba ibn Muslim in the conquest of Central Asia, and he was appointed as a judge. You notice here two things very important, that both of these great men were masters of the law, <laughs> and this will always be one of the fundamentals of the Sufi path. You cannot be a sheikh if you are not a faqih. You've got to know the law and to live the law to be a sheikh. But not every sheikh is going, not every faqih is a sheikh. But these people are the biggest masters of the law that you can imagine. And it is said that Qutayba ibn Muslim once said to Muhammad ibn Wasi' that the finger 
of Muhammad ibn Wasi' pointing up towards heaven in battle is more beloved to me, more dear to me, more valuable to me as a commander than 100,000 renowned swords in the hands of 100,000 fetas, 100,000 chivalrous youth, excellent soldiers, 100,000. But just to have uh, Muhammad bin Wasi' say, La ilaha illallah, and point his finger at heaven, that's victory for me. And it's said that Muhammad ibn Wasi' possessed only two garments. This was true of a lot of the Sufis and also of the Sahaba, sometimes less than that. And once he came to Qutayba ibn Muslim in Khurasan during the conquest of Central Asia, wearing a loose wool outer garment. And Qutayba said to him, what called you to wear something like this? And what did Muhammad ibn Wasi' say? Nothing. This is part of the culture of the Sahaba and of the Tabi'een. He didn't answer the question. He was silent. That. And then Qutayba said, I speak to you, but you don't answer me. And Wasi' replied, I dislike saying out of zuhud. So the wool was accepted with asceticism, was associated with asceticism. So he said, I dislike saying out of zuhud, such that I speak highly of myself, uzekki nafsi. So here you see this, I don't want to make a claim, not that I am a zahid or anything else, so I'll stay silent. Or that I say out of faqab, such that I complain to my Lord. So you have no other answer than silence. This is their beautiful culture and you're exposed to that yourself from your reading of the hadith and your reading of the beautiful reports of these people. And it's said of this great man that he would say, I never see anything but I see God in it. In other words, I see nothing but that it reminds me of God. And so what is that? Ihsan, right? I worship God as if I could see Him. And he said, I don't see anything but that it reminds me of God. And this is the station that we also hope that we will all have. Um, he is a contemporary of Malik ibn Dinar. And Malik ibn Dinar, who is a great successor of Basra, uh, he's one of the greatest of them all, very similar to Muhammad ibn Wasi'a. And it's said that he once said that people go through this life and they never taste the most delicious thing in it. And they said, what is that, Malik ibn Dinar? And he said, Ma'rifatullah, the knowledge of God. There is nothing sweeter, nothing more beautiful, nothing more delightful than the knowledge of God. But it's said that after Muhammad ibn Wasi' died and Malik ibn Dinar, that one of these Salihin, had a vision, a dream, and they saw Malik ibn Dinar going into heaven in front of uh, Muhammad ibn Wasi'. And then they want to know why was that, and they say because he had only one garment, whereas Muhammad ibn Wasi' had two. <laughs> so he got in front of him for that. Um, we also have a great person who died in 115. This is 733. I hope that's not too academic. Um, this is Abu Hashim as Zahid, who is also called as Sufi. So these are all people that this word is associated with, and it probably comes from them. And in all these cases, it has to do with Suf, by the way, with wool, which I prefer myself because there's no big deal in that. Safa is a big deal. But he, it is said, is the first to be known as a Sufi. <clears throat> and um, Sufyan al-Thawri, may Allah be pleased with him, um, he says that were it not for Abu Hashim as Sufi, so Sufyan al-Thawri, who's one of the great legal scholars and contemporaries of Imam Malik and Abu Hanifa, Sufyan al-Thawri, uh, he respects this man and he calls him as Sufi. 
No doubt the man was called that. But he said, were it not for Abu Hashim as Sufi, I would not have known the fine details of Riyya, of the hypocrisy of show. Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, may Allah be pleased with him, relates in Madad Yudis Salikin, and so does Ibn Jawzi, uh, in a chapter entitled Abu Hashim al Zahid in uh, uh, Sifat al Safwa, um, that Abu, Abu Nu'aym, who's the, er, the muhaddith of Hilyat al Awliya, he said that Sufyan al Thawri would say um, that if it were not for Abu Hashim as Sufi, that I would have never known these fine realities of hypocrisy. And um, yet also, um, he was among the most knowledgeable of people in jurisprudence, Abu Hashim. So these are not people ignorant of the law. These are people who know the law. Um, Ibn Jawzi, narrates the following about Abu Hashim, a Zahid or a Sufi. He says that he would say, Allah has stamped alienation, irtirab, upon the entire world around me. I find the whole world gharib. Nothing in it captivates me. Um, he said, Allah has stamped alienation upon the world in order that the friendly company of the Muridin consists solely in being with him, with God, and not with the world. Again, no hijab, no veil. These are simple things, brothers and sisters, but they're very, very important. You want to remove every veil between you and God, and then you will see with eyes that are clear. But he said that this alienation stamped on the world, this then removes that veil. And um, this enables us to obey God uh, and to draw close to Him by avoiding the world, by avoiding being deluded by it and be, being attached to it. And then he said, the people of knowledge of God, Ahlul Ma'rifati Billah, they are strangers in the world and they long after the hereafter. Um, there's another great figure of the second century who is called a Sufi. So we've got four with him. And uh, I want to mention this great man. This is Jabir ibn Hayyan. Jabir ibn Hayyan was one of the greatest minds in human history. Brilliant human being. And uh, he was a polymath, which as you know in English means that he mastered many, many things. He was a master of many fields. Chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, engineering, architecture, geography, medicine, natural philosophy, including the science of embryos. Um, and he's also often called father of chemistry. And uh, he was called a Sufi. <clears throat> um, he, by the way, is um, one of the first rooters of knowledge in Islam. And this is a very, very great achievement of our civilization. The beginning, perhaps in the second century, and many people say this begins with Jabir, that we have these great men and women, many of them from Basra, by the way, many of them actually not very well known, who begin to root knowledge, embryology, chemistry, mathematics, um, veterinary medicine, botany, everything they knew, by finding the common principles that tie them all together. This is a civilizational achievement of the greatest order. And um, we must Never forget this, and it must be one of our ambitions that perhaps this ummah can be, can play a role in doing that again. But Jabir is one of the ones who did that, and he is closely associated with Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. And for us, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is one of the Imams of the path, and we regard him to be one of us.
and we hope to be one of him. Um, Jabir has many books in chemistry and in other things as well. But one of his books is called Kitab al Sabain, the book of the 70, of the 70 chapters. And um, I often talk about this book. I was told to read it by one of the great scholars, you know, um, that, of this time. And, you know, again it begins with the praise of God. Beautiful praise of God. Elaborate praise of God. And then it talks about the imperative of self-purification. And then essentially, beginning the 70 chapters of chemistry, he prefaces that by words that I would paraphrase as saying that if you don't join in this praise of God, and if you don't understand this imperative of self-purification, you have no need of chemistry. There's no reason for you to study it. It's very difficult for us to understand that. But it's very important for us to understand that. And that's because the objective of science among these great people, and in our civilization in general, and also in that of many other traditional peoples, the objective of science is what? To study God's creation to know yourself and by knowing yourself to know your Lord. So it's an amazing process that even in something which today for us is so secular and mundane as chemistry and so materialistic as the way that chemistry is presented today, that was regarded as a spiritual subject. So people like Jabir are part of that. And again, he's called a Sufi and we could say his Sheikh is Jafar al-Sadiq. God be pleased with him. So, um, perversion of a reality with the same name. Um, maybe I won't do this right now. Um, I might put this off till next time. Um, how are we coming with time, by the way? How are we coming with time? Okay, so inshallah, let's, let's go to this other topic. Um, we want to talk about Sharia and Haqiqah, and it may be that we come back to this bi idni lahi ta'ala. Um, MashaAllah. So, um, Imam al Ghazali is very clear, and he's not unique in any regard in this matter. That the greatness of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, and Imam al-Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and we can say this about Sufyan al-Thawri, and about every single one of these great fuqaha. It's because they were something much more than just fuqaha. They were something much more than just scholars of the outward law. They were also people of this reality that had no name, that in their time is taking on a name. So all of them also had sheikhs. That's very important. And Imam al-Ghazali says, the problem with the fuqaha today is that they only follow the imams of fiqh, al-Shafi'i, Malik, Abu Hanifa, and Ahmed in fiqh. And they don't follow them closely enough in that or in other things. They should follow their complete way. And their complete way was to join this with spiritual knowledge. So who was the Shaykh of Abu Hanifa? God be pleased with him. This is well known. It was Ja'far al-Sadiq. Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Baqir. And Imam Abu Hanifa says clearly, were it not for two years that an numan Abu Hanifa spent with Imam Ja'far, lahalak al numan and Nu'man Abu Hanifa would have been destroyed. And again for us, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq ala al-Ra'si wal-Ain and Muhammad al-Baqir ala al-Ra'si wal-Ain. These are our Imams. We have no doubts whatsoever about them and about their absolute authenticity. So, <clears throat> um, and also Imam Ja'far, you know that he is one of the students of his 
uh, of uh, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and of many others, of his father Muhammad al-Baqir, who takes from Zayn al-Abidin and from many others. Also, um, Imam Jafar had a tafsir that had in it many of the fundamental elements of what will become Sufi teaching. And the Sufis will transmit from that, as Sulami and others. Imam Malik, who were his sheikhs. And here, it is generally said that the most prominent of them are Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and his illustrious son, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Both of them, of course, were in Medina. And Imam Malik grew up with them. He spent his life with them. <clears throat> Imam al-Shafi'i, um, his shaykh is Shaybān al-Ra'i, who is one of the great awliya of that early period. And he has a shaykh as well, and every Egyptian should know her, as Sayyida Nafisa bint al-Hasan al-Anwar. Okay, as Sayyida Nafisa is the shaykh of Imam al-Shafi'i, radiyallahu anhu, and uh, anha. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, his shaykh is Shaybān al-Ra'i. This is one of his shaykh, and he has another one also who is Ma'ruf al-Karhi. So this is a very, very important relationship. And this is, in Imam Ghazali's opinion, and in the opinion of many others, the secret of the greatness of those men. So the sacred law in Sufism is sacred. The Sharia ah in Sufism is sacred law and it is Sufism. And there is no Sufism without it. And there is no Sufism in contradiction of it. And there is no Sufism in the rejection of it. Again, the great Sufis were jurisprudence. They were fuqaha. And their Sufism was from that. And Sufism always breathed life into the law. It breathed life into the law. It's very, and the law breathed, breathed life into it. You cannot have the one without the other. <clears throat> Imam al-Junaid, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, this knowledge of ours is erected, mushayyid, it is erected upon the foundations of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. It is erected upon the foundations of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. It's not taken from Hinduism or Buddhism, Buddhism or Confucianism or anything else. With all due respect, you know, for everything great in those traditions. And there's a lot in those traditions that is great. And there is a lot in those traditions which is also similar and in Christianity, and in Judaism as well. Okay, those are parallels that go back without any doubt in my mind to the ancient prophetic past, and also to the wisdom of great men and women of illumination and of God. But this science of Sufism is internal to us, and the similarities that it has um, are not taken from the things that it is similar to. But Imam al-Junaid, he emphasizes that over and over again. Imam al-Sha'rani, Imam al-Ta'ifatayn, this great Egyptian Imam, <clears throat> he says, every, every shaykh is a faqih, but not every faqih is a shaykh. That's where I got that expression which you heard earlier. And he says, it is a matter of consensus among the Sufis that no one is qualified to preside over their path except one who has profound mastery of the Sharia. Ah. They may not tell you that, but you will see if you examine them that they know it. They have intimate knowledge of the law and they do not take the law lightly and they apply it to themselves, sometimes even with severity. Not to you, but to themselves. <clears throat> and as Sha'rani says, the Sufis were beyond reproach regarding the Sharia. Ah. In every case, 
It was their adherence to the prophetic law that brought them close to God. Their apparent lack of conformity to the law in certain cases is only problematic for people who lack profound legal knowledge and do not understand its non-normative options. Um, so the Sufis sometimes do things that are unusual. And um, an example that I often tell is the one of the great Sheikh of Morocco in the 17th century, Ali al-Jamal, who made his murid, he's a Sharif, and he made his murid, Sharif Muhammad al-Arabi al-Darqawi, who's a Sharif of a big family of Shurafa. He made him put on rags and sit on the garbage dump outside of Fez. Okay, uh, would that be generally allowed in Islamic law? No, because hifthul ird, the preservation of honor, is one of the maqasid of the sharia, ah, and that's not how we preserve our honor. And yet, in this case, it was obligatory. Because of the fact that Sidi Ali al-Jamal understood that this great man could only attain his greatment by the breaking of his ego. And so therefore he sat there, he offended his family, his family offended him, uh, the people came out to talk about him, children threw rocks and other things, okay, and this didn't have to last too long, but it had to last long enough so that his ego was broken. And then when his ego was broken, we can build the beautiful edifice that will become this wali of Allah. And so this is not normative law, but neither is it forbidden by the law, especially in a case like that. Because to save him from hypocrisy, to save him from ujub, being filled with himself, be admiring himself, that's necessary for the sincerity of his spiritual path. Would you do this? No. And could you advise people to do this? No. That's why we, when we say, we, that's why we say when we talk about the tarbiyah of the sheikhs, the spiritual education of the sheikhs, that you imitate them in everything, but don't imitate them in their tarbiyah. Okay, because they do that on special circumstances. And in Islamic law, and all of us who study Islamic law study this, that there is a time when you can take wine. And when is that? If you're choking on meat. And people who eat lots of meat, as some of our people do. Um, you know, and you can die from choking on meat. You know, and um, therefore, if you're choking on meat, you can actually take wine to get you to break that so that you can live. This is in all of our books of fit. Is it allowed for you to drink wine? Absolutely not. Everybody knows that. And yet, that wine has the ability to enable you to save yourself from choking to death. Okay, so this is similar to that. These are non-normative aspects of the law. And these people, everything they do that seems unusual, it will fit in a category like that. That's why it's important also to have husn al-dhan bihim bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Shaykh Ahmed Zarruq, may God be pleased with him. He says that without the law, there is no Sufism at all. And again, understand that he is not unique in saying this. Um, he said, the outward rulings of God cannot be known except by means of the law. And one of the principles of Irshad of guidance is you must have hudud, you must have limits, you must have thawabit, you must have thawabit, you must have certain things that are unchanging and fixed. It can't all be chaos, it can't be all feel good, it can't all be what do I want to do, what, do I, what is pleasing to me and what is not. For the outward rulings of God cannot be known by any other means than the law. At the same time, there can be no knowledge of the law except in conjunction with Sufism. 
for there is no valid practice except on the basis of truthfulness and no sound orientation toward God except with certain faith. It's time to finish, isn't it? Uh, let's, let me just take a little bit more. Just two more people. Three. Um, <laughs> Al-Qutb al-Dardir from Cairo, this blessed city. He says, Al-Haqiqah is the intrinsic reality of the secrets of the Sharia. He's one of the masters of the law, masters of theology, masters of the path. But all of these haqqaiq, they come out of the secrets of the Sharia. Uh, Shaykh Muhammad ibn al-Arabi al-Darqawi, whom we mentioned just a minute ago, the garbage dump, one of the greatest of the awliya, he said, whoever desires that freedom, hurriya, show him her beautiful face, let him show her the face of servitude, ubudiya, to God, which means to have upright intentions, truthful love, a good opinion of others, noble character, and careful adherence to the law, to its commands and prohibitions without any alteration or change. You've got to take the law seriously. And Ahmed al-Alawi of the 20th century, um, he says, as for the perfected ones, meaning the great Sufis, who would never call them the, themselves this, but that's what they were, it is known from their sayings far and wide that the ultimate reality, al-Haqiqah, can never be separated from the religious law or vice versa. Among these sayings of theirs is the statement, whoever realizes the ultimate reality but does not master the law becomes a heretic. And whoever masters the law but does not realize the ultimate reality becomes a profligate. Forgive me if those words are too big. But men tahakkaka that whoever takes on the haqiqah but does not live by the sharia becomes a zindiq, heretic, that's a really bad word. And whoever lives by the law only and doesn't imbibe the haqiqah, they will become fasiq, despite all their knowledge of all the details of law. This is again why Imam al-Ghazali says, I fear a bad end for anyone who doesn't have a taste of this knowledge. And then he will say, among, uh, he says that among their statements is that the ultimate reality, the haqiqah, is hidden within the religious law like butter is hidden within the milk. Okay, full milk. And to get the butter you have to churn. So you have to do ijtihad. Those who have true knowledge of God, and this is where we'll end today, uh, those who have true knowledge of God are not veiled by the outward aspects of things from their inward realities, nor are they veiled by the inward realities of things from their outward aspects. They put the outward and the inward together. The vahir and the batin go perfectly together. This is one of the hallmarks of true Islam. And that's why in Islam we have vahiri bid'ah. We have bid'ah that is exoteric. And we have batini bid'ah. Bid'ah that is esoteric. And the Sufis have both of them together without any bid'ah, without any contradiction. So... The outward utterance of speech does not veil them from its meaning, nor does the meaning veil them from the outward utterance. And we'll end with these beautiful words for tonight. Their feet are firmly planted within both presences. Their feet are firmly planted uh, in both presences, the outward and the inward. 
uh, let's stop here for tonight, inshallah. And I, um, I'm thankful that you're here. May we be successful, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. And uh, now we'll take time for questions, inshallah. What is that? Uh, are those questions? What about if you were to go through them and to see which ones would be the ones to answer? Uh, I, I'm really bad about this. Always avoiding work, that's me. <clears throat> Always avoiding difficult decisions also. Yeah, so if they've already answered, then there's no need. Um, inshallah, tomorrow we start again at 7 o'clock. We will start on time, inshallah. And um, I really hope that you'll be able to be in all five sessions. We'll try not to repeat ourselves too much. We'll try to take something new each time. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Why do we need to label someone who is a good Muslim man or woman? Um, um, yeah. Um, is this it? What is the verse in Ar Rahman? Uh, what is it? Astaghfirullah. Uh, what is the verse? Al Ihsan Jaza Al Ihsan. How does it go? What is it? Wama, isn't it? Wama Jaza Al Ihsan Illa Ihsan. Is that it? Did I get it? Wama Jaza Al Ihsan Illa Al Ihsan. Hal Jaza Al Ihsan Illa Al Ihsan. Yeah, that's the verse. Um, you know, the reward, this is a rhetorical question, of course. Indeed, uh, the reward of Ihsan is Ihsan. But we don't call ourselves Muhsinin. Okay, and the question here of our wonderful brother or sister is why do we need to label someone? Um, we don't label things. Uh, labels, label is, a not, is not a good word. But we give things names because they have realities. And we give things names because we define them and we want to identify them. So Islam is a civilization of definition and name. And therefore, we want to say, what is this phenomenon? And one of the reasons why Sufism comes about in Islamic history is because it is such a huge part of who we were and it is something special because of the fact that it is the tree that Ihsan planted and that bore so many different types of fruit. So um, we call things names. We say he is a muhaddith. She is a faqiha. She is a mujtahida. He is a nahwi. He is uh, a scholar of sarf. Okay, and لا مشحت في هذه الألفاظ والمصطلحات. There is no um, prohibition or no, what do we say, you know, greediness or can you give me a better word, you know, in, in these words. There's no problem with that, inshallah. Okay, and this is one of the greatnesses of God, that you do ihsan, He will reward you with ihsan, something infinitely greater, which is one of the secrets of tasawwuf. Because when you live that ihsan, as they do, what will they be given as a consequence of it? Incredible gifts. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, how should one respond to the claim that wanting gnosis 
of God, knowledge of God, intimate direct knowledge of God in this life, is in patience since one will be granted that in Jannah. Um, I don't know actually who makes a claim like that, but the brother who asked the question, uh, who gives me his name, uh, he obviously does. Um, and he could explain it. Um, no doubt there's a person or there are people who say that. Um, the fact is that uh, this world is the place where you want to attain that gift. This is one of the main purposes of the religion. It is that you worship God. And we say, and Allah says in the Quran, that I did not create the spirits and human beings, but that they worship me. And from the days of the Sahaba, with Ibn Abbas and no doubt others, we are told, and this would be a tafsir taken from the Prophet, in my belief, that here, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I didn't create the spirits and the human beings, but that they worship me. That Ya'budun is a wasila. And the maqsid is al ma'rifa. So, what it's actually saying is, I did not create the jinn and human beings, but that they know me. But that they come to my ma'rifa. That they arrive at that. But Part of the wisdom of God is that the verse doesn't say that because it gives us instead the means to that which is ibadah and ubudiyah. And this is why also Sufism is not philosophy and it should never be confused with that. In its intellectual history, it will correct the philosophers. It will, in fact, review the entire intellectual history of Islam and it will make comments about its evaluation of what was wrong and what was right. Okay, but that's not philosophy. In any case, they insist it's not philosophy. But it's illumination. An illumination that comes from the knowledge of the Sharia and the practice of the Sharia and of Ibadah. And so the, we come to the knowledge of God through the worship of God and through the practice of His law and this good life that Islam gives us. And this is called Jannatul Ma'rifah. And it is, we call it the Jannah of this dunya and of the hereafter. That if you enter into this Jannah here, then the benefits that you have of it, from it, are infinite. That's why Malik ibn Dinar said that most people live this, leave this world never having tasted what is most delicious in it, the knowledge of God. You want that here. We believe in our tradition, and perhaps we'll come to this, that the people of the garden have many varying degrees of ma'rifah, and they never cease to increase in ma'rifah, because ma'rifah has no end. The knowledge of God has no end that it reaches that it doesn't go beyond. Only God truly knows God. And in the garden itself, the prophets themselves will have ever-increasing degrees of ma'rifah in every breath. And the believers there will have degrees that are different. And we're told in the hadith, the differences between believers that are like the differences between the earth and the stars. So your ma'rifah in the garden will be determined by your ma'rifah here. This is very, very important. And we are created to worship God, and we're created to worship God to know God. Going back to the companions, this position was held. We are created also to be perfected by that knowledge. And that's why we refer to these great men and women as perfected human beings. Perfected on what basis? On the basis of following the perfect one, the Prophet Wasallam. And the perfection that was there in the prophets and the messengers before. So the path of tasawwuf is also a path of self-perfection. Getting yourself right, as right as you can get yourself. Putting yourself in order. And the awliya of Allah, we'll talk about this probably in the lesson after the next one. 
But the awliya have a very special relationship with creation, and creation has a very special relationship with them. And we know this from the Prophet Sallallahu And we'll talk about that. But these are the people that, you know, the birds and the ants and the fish in the sea, they pray for them, they cry for them when they die. These are people who sustain the world in some miraculous way that our Prophet himself tells us about. And we will give you a hadith on that when the time comes, bi ta'ala. So you are to strive in this world to perfect yourself and to become the best that you can be. And when you do that, you serve a purpose in creation that only you can serve as the son or the daughter of Adam. And of course, we're created also to be the khulafa, to be the caliphs of God on earth. And how could you be that without the knowledge of God? And how could you be that without the perfection of yourself? One of the disasters of political Islam is the attempt to take political power when you have not been psychologically and spiritually trained. You will be destroyed. You need to be like Abu Bakr. You need to be like Umar. You need to be like Salah al-Din. And all of these people were trained so that the world wouldn't overwhelm them and so that they could actually play that positive role. I'm very sorry that our time is up. Um, pray for me and uh, may um, you know we benefit from these classes. Um, every time I've been here, every time we've taught here, it's been a great benefit for me and a great joy. And I hope and pray that these next four days will be that way for us too. Allahumma wa fiqna li ma tuhibbuhu wa tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimatil huda alimna ma yanfa'una wa wa fiqna lil amali bima alamtana bih واجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار والسلام عليكم <تصفيق>